There was a man named Carl Montgomery that had lived most of his life up in the mountains. He didn't get out very much at all. But for some reason, in some way, he had got news that there was this traveling zoo that was coming to that area. And he'd never seen a zoo before, never seen these animals. So he decided he would go. So he walked several miles to get there. And when he got to the zoo, one of the first animals that he noticed was this rhinoceros. Never seen one before. Never heard of one before. And he read the little label there that said it was rhinoceros. And, and Carl stood there for about 20 minutes looking at this rhinoceros, just completely captivated by it. And finally turned around to the keeper and said, you can't fool me, there ain't no such animal. Hmm. What more proof could he want? What more proof could he have? The, the animal is standing right there in front of him. How can he say that there is no such thing? It's right there in front of him. Well, that's the same way people are with Jesus, that they want to dismiss who he is. And, and this whole passage here that we saw in John, the end of chapter 9 through chapter 10, was, was the fact that Jesus is standing right in front of these people. He's right here speaking to them. And their response was, he's not really who he says he is. So I want to look especially from verse 19 and, or 22 and following here as we look about these people. Okay? All that he has talked to them about, and that's, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to take a, a brief tour of the ministry of Jesus about some of the things that he did, some of the things that he claimed. And it, it's unbelievable to me that after all of these people saying in chapter 8 and 9 and 10 here that they come to Jesus in verse 24 and they ask him this question, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. He already has. He has spoken this several times to them about who he is. And his response is that if you can't believe in what I say, at least give credit to what I have done. And that's how we're going to look at this. We're going to start with his credentials. Look at the things that Jesus has done. That I've listed here some of the miracles that Jesus has performed. The first one, can you tell me what that is? Water and the wine at this wedding. The first public miracle that he's going to perform is going to be at a wedding in King of Galilee. They ran out of wine or grape juice, and he changes the water into wine. Anybody have any idea who this lady is? This is audience participation. Faith. Um, that's okay. okay. Anybody? When Jesus is traveling one time, there is this lady that has had this blood issue for 12 years that she cannot stop bleeding. And just by touching the hem of his garment, she's healed by that. At the same time, there is a 12-year-old girl that has died that Jesus raises from the dead. Here is Peter's mother-in-law that one of the first miracles that Jesus performs is that he goes in and he revives and heals Peter's mother-in-law. What about this one? He walks in the water. Pardon me? Calms the sea? Okay. okay. My hearing is not the best, I guess. Or your voice is one of two. Or maybe both. Okay. Calming the sea. You know, this is an interesting to me about the disciples here how their faith grows, because this happens, I think, Matthew chapter 8. He's in the boat and he's asleep. And this great storm's coming up, and the disciples who are veteran fishermen think they're going to drown here. And they go to Jesus and they wake him up. And they say to him, we're going to drown, which what a ridiculous statement that is. In all honesty, folks, is Jesus going to drown in a boat? And if he's in the same boat we are, are we going to drown? Okay. But at the end of this, he gets up and he says, peace be still. And the waves are completely still. Okay? Uh, there are those say that wasn't a miracle. The storm just happened to end. 
But if you watch the Weather Channel or news when there's a hurricane or whatever, the hurricane passes, but those waves for days are bouncing against the shore. Here, they're completely still. And the disciples ask the question, who is this man? That even the sea obeys his voice. The beginning of their faith here. Matthew chapter 17, anybody know what I'm talking about here? Anybody? Transfiguration. That Jesus goes upon this mountain, Moses, the Elijah appear, and God in an audible voice speaks, this is my son and whom I know, please listen to him. It's a change here from the Old Testament to the New is what's happening there. And in this whole transfiguration that Jesus is allowing his disciples, Peter, James, and John, to capture a, a little essence of who he really is, that this is God in the flesh that is before us. Mark chapter 2. Anybody remember this story? Okay. Remember the guy that's paralyzed and his friends laying down through the hole in the ceiling? And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. But then he says a very interesting statement to show that I have the power to forgive sin. Take up your mat and walk. That he shows his power over the spiritual world, over the physical world. This is one of the, those that kind of catches me at times. Anybody? If you know, then you get an A minus today. The widow of Maine's son. Okay? That I remember, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember his name now. Moody. Dwight Moody, that when he was preaching, he was called to perform his first funeral. And he went through the Bible to see what he should preach. And he said, for the first time, I realized that Jesus disrupted every funeral he went to. That when he went there, they might be dead, but when he left, they were alive again. He didn't know what he should preach about that. But here's the widow of Nain's son. Okay? Widow means what? Her husband has died, and now her only son has died. They're on their way to the cemetery to bury him. And Jesus walks up, and what does he do? Anybody? He raises him from the dead. He raised him from the dead. Now, we can't get very excited about that. Tell me, when's the last time you saw anyone raised from the dead? Okay. John chapter 5, the man is paralyzed. That Jesus just tells him, pick up your mat and walk. I threw this one in here because this is a public place again. Very much so. This one? Okay, Jesus walking on the water at the same time that Matthew 14. John 6, that Jesus walks on the water, and that's when he has Peter walk on the water. You know, people say, well, we can't walk on the water, but you read those verses, it says that Peter walked on the water by the power of Jesus. John chapter 9, that we just looked at last week or two weeks ago, the man that was born blind. Okay? Now, this is a, a fascinating thing here. One, this is a great statement of who the Messiah, what he would do. That there have been a lot of people healed of diseases, but never congenital blindness. He was blind from birth. It's not something that happened to him in his life. First time this ever happens in Scripture. And it's one of the signs that the Messiah would perform that is not mentioned anywhere else but here in John 9. Now, if you were a Jewish person and you knew all this, what would your reaction be to this man that heals a man that's been blind from birth? This one, will, we've looked at several different times. This would be him raising the blasters. Okay. Don't you ever get an idea of what it would have been like to be there? Can you imagine what it must have been like to be there? He's been dead how long? Four days. His body's decomposing. It is Martha that says, there's going to be a stench here. Don't, don't do this. And Jesus said, didn't I tell you, if you believe, you see the glory of God. And this man, Jesus, what does he do? He calls him very much. Lazarus, come forth. And the dead man comes walking out of the tomb. When's the last time you saw something like that happen? What about your favorite miracles? You want to share a few that, that you are especially prone to as far as the life of Jesus? Anybody? Have I covered them all? Peter walking on the water. Anybody else? 
It says at the end of the Gospel of John that all the things that Jesus said and did could not be recorded. It would take all the books of the world to include all of that. Okay. Tell us plainly, Jesus, whether you're the Messiah or not. Make a plain statement to us is what these people are asking of him. These miracles, they demonstrate his divine authority. They demonstrate his divine power that he has. The character of Jesus, these miracles, indicates his true identity. He worked miracles over nature, over disease, over death. That all of these show who he really is, yet these people are standing there saying, tell us plainly who you are. Quit beating around the bush. Why are you keeping us in suspense? Tell us who you are. And Jesus' answer is, I've already told you. I've already told you. If you don't believe me for who I am, what about the miracles that I have performed? And it's very possible that Jesus is asking this, his church the same question. It seems like we're still struggling about who he is. We're still struggling about the power that he has. If we don't believe the statements that he makes, at least believe what he has done. How many of you believe that this Bible is true? How many of us are living according to what this Bible says, the teachings of Jesus? See, there's, there's the, the rub that we have here. That we are still struggling about if we believe who this guy really is. The problem is that we won't heed the evidence. That we don't realize the significance of what Jesus did. Of the life that he led here on 33 short years. The things that he did. The things that he accomplished. We could talk forever about the miracles that he has performed. But do we believe they happened or not? And if we believe they happened, do we believe who he is then? See, he says, believe me for what I have done. Look at the things that he did. Now, miracles are not going to make us believe. If we look in John chapter 11 with the raising of Lazarus. After Lazarus is raised, the beginning of John chapter 12, you know what the Jewish leaders decide? Anybody? Jesus has to die. He just raised this man from the dead. Jesus has to die. And secondly, we've got to kill Lazarus too to take away the evidence. Okay? So the, the miracles are not going to make us believe, but those of us that claim that we have put our faith in Christ, it should encourage us in our faith. It should strengthen us in what we believe because of what this man has done with historical belief. If we are not ready to believe his words, Jesus said, at least believe what I've done. The second step is claims. Now, I sat in a, a discussion one time where the, the leader of the discussion group said, Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. And I fell off my chair. I didn't fall off my chair. I jumped up and I said, what? You must have a different Bible than I've got. Because we look through this, he's always making that claim of who he is. So we look at the claims that Jesus has. He declared himself to be the Messiah. And we're all for that. Okay? That means Savior. That means the Anointed One. That he is the Christ, the one that God has sent. And we're all, all for that. But then he says, I'm Lord. And we're not sure we like that. I know about you, Jim. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. Do you? I don't know, for 50 years. It's... Oh, wait, that's another sermon. I'm sorry. There's the problem. I want to live. What you say, Pat? Anything you want to share? No, okay. <laughs> she said something to Rudy, but anyway. We want to live however we want to live. And I'll be darned if God's going to tell me any different. Who, who does he think he is? Who does Jesus think he is to tell me how to live my life? And Jesus tells us who he is. See, we want him as Messiah. We're just not sure we're going as Lord. We want him to save us from our sins, and we want all the blessings that we can get because of who Christ is and the power that he has. But this idea of allegiance, I'm not so sure about that. I want to be free to do what I want to do when I decide I want to do it. It's like the, the story of the little girl that's walking with her grandfather and they're over some rough sidewalk and they're walking along. She trips, she falls, skins her knee. 
Grandpa gets her up, brushes the knee off. They begin to walk again. In just a little while, she falls again. And this time, her knee's bleeding a little bit. So Grandpa takes his handkerchief out and cleans it all up. And she says next, when they start to walk, Grandpa, I want to hold your hand. So they walk for a little bit further, and she falls again. And this time, it just opened up the scab and the, the cut that was on her knee started bleeding and, and Grandpa cleans it all up and as they start to walk again she says, Grandpa, I don't want to hold your hand anymore. I want you to hold mine. Okay. Now I believe, folks, that's the difference between a church member and a Christian. If I'm holding on to Jesus' hand, I can let go whenever I decide to. But if he's holding on to mine, I'm going to have to go where he wants me to go. Jesus said, I'm the shepherd of the sheep. They, the sheep know my voice and they follow me. That's the key to all of this. Not hearing, but following. Not knowing all that Jesus has said, but putting enough trust in that to step out and live the way Jesus has taught me that I am to live. The problem is not Jesus' miracles. The problem that the world has, the problem we have, is his words because they cut sometimes don't they they hit us in the heart sometimes don't they and we just as soon not go through that okay in john chapter 3 it is nicodemus that comes to jesus and you know what he says to jesus we know that you are a teacher come from god or you couldn't do the things that you're doing he already understands that now he's mixed up you know, Jesus wasn't a teacher come from God. He was God who had come to teach. But you get the drift already. They look at what Jesus is saying and know somebody special is here in front of us. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says the people were awed at the, the authority of Jesus. He spoke, and he did. All you have to do is look at the Sermon on the Mount to determine who Jesus says he is. It has been said to you, you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, how many times that's mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount? What's he doing? He's usurping the Old Testament law. Who wrote the Old Testament law? Anybody? God. God. Who's the only one that could overrule the Old Testament law? God. Yeah. Problem solved right there in a short message that he has that we call the Sermon on the Mount. We look at his claims. And when they say, who are you? He says, have you ever told your children, I've already said it. You heard what I said. You ever? Children sometimes have hearing problems, don't they? Okay. And he said, I've already told you. You heard what I said. You know who I am. And that's the problem that they're trying to struggle with. It's not a, a matter of do they understand what Jesus is saying. I think they do. I think we do. There's the problem. That we understand the implications of who Jesus says that he is. And so we try to skirt around it. We try to not have to deal directly with the fact of who this man is that is speaking to us. He showed us the works of God, but he also spoke to us the words of God. These leaders can't trap him. They can't explain the miracles. They can't poke holes in his teachings. What are they going to do with him? Eventually, kill him. And that's what we'll do. Oh, not, not so much physically, but emotionally, spiritually, we will. That we'll just step back and, and not live in faith anymore. That we will just pull back because if I follow where Jesus wants me to go, I may not go where I want to be at. I may not be the person that I want to be. I may not be able to, to live a life that I would rather live if I really understand who Jesus is. See, the, the real problem here is unbelief. It's not lack of communication. It's not a problem that Jesus hasn't said, here's who I am. They don't want to hear it. And times we don't either. We don't want to know that He is Creator. We don't want to know that He's Redeemer, that He is Lord over all. Because if he is a creator, what does that make me? The creation. And the creator has the power over the creation. And we're not sure that we're sold on that, you see. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, I got ahead of myself. 
In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Whenever the beginning was, Jesus was there with the Father. That He is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. And then in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and lived among us for a while. We beheld His glory, full of grace, and as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just for a second, I want to... The Word dwelt there. See, I... I'm, I'm sorry that there are some of the translations, even though it's correct, that change that word to dwelt from tabernacled. Okay? That's what that word is. He tabernacled with us. What was the tabernacle? Go ahead, Mark. House of God. And Jesus tabernacled with us. Folks, He is the one place where God and people can meet. In the tabernacle of the Old Testament, in the, in the person of Jesus Christ today. He's the only place we can. And he tabernacled, he pitched his tent, and he lived with us. He was the place of worship. Remember what he said to the woman of the well? Okay? That in spirit and truth, it's in Jesus that we can worship him. Only in Christ can we approach God and have this common place where God and us can be. In John chapter 1, when John the Baptist sees Jesus walking. What does he say? Verse 29. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What was the Lamb for? That he sacrificed. He sacrificed for our sin. Nicodemus. You know what he says to Nicodemus? I am God's one and only Son in the midst of John 3.16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. One and only Unique, one-of-a-kind Son. Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God. The woman at the well. After a conversation with the woman at the well, the woman says, we know that one day the Messiah will come. And what does Jesus say? It's me. It is He who is speaking to you. Never claimed to be the Son of God. John chapter 5. These are the people that keep asking, who are you? Who are you? And you read about verse 25. You know what he says to these guys? I am the Son of God. How hard is that, Chuck? I mean, even Judy could understand that, right? Yeah. Okay. He makes a plain statement to them. In chapter 6, he calls himself what? What did he do in John chapter 6? Bread of life. I am the bread of life. There are seven I am's that Jesus states in the Gospel of John. Every one of them talking about His deity. Every one of them saying that He is equal to the Father. John chapter 8. In the midst of all this celebration, He, he stands in front of the people and says what? I am the light of the world. Okay? The emphasis is tremendous on these words that He is saying here to these people. The man born blind in John chapter 9. Do you know this, this Jesus? May I meet him so that I may know him. And he bows down and Jesus says to him, I am the Son of God. And he worships him. Oops. Is Jesus not God? How does this man get away with worshiping him? Why didn't Jesus stop him and say, no, 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 no. You don't understand. But he did worship him. And Jesus accepts that worship. He is the Lamb. He is the Good Shepherd. He is the Gate. He is the Son of God that is before them. In John chapter 10, that we just went through, verse 36. So why are you upset when I say I am God's Son? Direct statement to these people over and over again. Any idea who this guy is? Boy, unless I can put my fingers in his hand, nail prints in his hand, my hand in his side, I'm not going to believe. And his name is Thomas. Yes. Eight days later, Jesus appears before the disciples with Thomas there. And he says to Thomas, go ahead, put your finger in the nail prints, put your hand in my side. And John, I don't know that he dropped to his knee, but I kind of figure he did. He has five words to say to Jesus. You know what he said? What? My Lord and my God. See, sometimes when we're in front of God, there's not a whole lot to say. There's not a whole lot of discussion that has to take place. The mistake that we make, you see, is trying to analyze God. 
trying to figure him out. And all he wants is for us to drop to our knees and before him and acknowledge who he is. And from then on, allow him to do what he is doing. Any statements of Jesus that might be your favorite? Anything that would point to his deity, to who he really is? Anybody? I know I covered quite a few of them here. A lot of them in John or other in the other Gospels, and he's very direct as he makes his statement before these people. The problem is that these statements demand a response. You know, there's no way in the world that Jesus can stand here and say, I am the Son of God, and for people to go, oh, that's nice. Problem is we do. We do. Because we haven't come to terms with who he is. Not really. Because you see, I believe if we did, we'd be living differently than we are. In a big way, in a big way. Okay. Last night, about 9 o'clock last night, I walked out to Walmart, and I'm just going in, the front door is still on the outside there, what uh, Madison and I call the bumpy bump. She loves to ride a car across that, but that's another message. This guy walks up to the side of me, he's got a, a lady with him, this little kid, that he, a little child that he's carrying, and he looks at me and said, oh, you finally got out of prison. <laughs> So I look at him and I'm trying to figure out, do I know this guy? Is he kidding me or what? Never saw this guy before in my life. And he walks up and he said, when did you get out? And I said, well, <laughs> since I've never been in, <laughs> oh, he said, I've got the wrong guy. <laughs> and I said, yes, you do. <laughs> we talked for a few moments. When Jesus reveals himself to us in scripture, there, there comes a time, I believe, that we see him and we say, boy, I got the wrong guy here. This is not who I thought he would be. This is not I, what I had in my mind. You see, I still believe that we are guilty in today's church that they were back in the time that Jesus walked in this world. We're trying to control him. We're trying to put him where we're comfortable with him and refuse to allow him to be any more than what we believe he is. And he's not going to go along with that. Okay? If I don't acknowledge him for who he really is, folks, he's going to walk away. He's not going to take second place. He's not going to compromise. He's not going to just stick around. He's going to walk away. And the key to all of this, I don't care what else we believe, if we don't acknowledge who Jesus really is, I mean, not just in our head, but in our hearts, we're lost. I don't care how many Sundays you come to church. I don't care anything else. If you've missed this point, you've missed it all. Because the demands that he makes are based on the fact of who he is. And I can't miss that. I can't miss that. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I understand all the implications of the names Jesus has given himself. Because I don't. I don't. Okay? But I do have the ability to understand, to a certain extent, the demands that he puts upon me. We have to respond to him. Is the problem, folks, that Jesus is more than we want him to be? That we want him packaged up and nice and prim and proper, and he refuses to do that. He just absolutely refuses to do that. When he wouldn't do it for the Jewish people, what did they do? Same. Are we going to have such a great problem with him that we're just going to dismiss him? Well, we're still Centennial Christian Church, and I'm still a Christian, but I really don't want this guy around. He puts too much pressure on me. But you see, he has one more statement to make to us here, and I've labeled that as his communion, because in John chapter 10, verse 30, you know what he says? The Father and I are one. Now, I want you to understand without getting too technical, the word that is used there for one means one in nature, one in essence, one in purpose, one in will. He's just not saying that I'm in harmony with what God wants me to do. What is he saying? I'm him. We are one. You can't separate us. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. 
What a great claim that he makes here. And we understand what the Jews are saying here because twice they try to stone him. Twice they try to grab him to kill him. And he says, why? What miracles are you upset about? And he says, it's not the miracles. It's what you're saying that we disagree with. That he has promised two things here. That he declares his equality and his union with his, his father and his nature. That Jesus affirms that who he is, his claim to deity that is here. See, if the Holy Spirit is in your life, that is the, the sign that Jesus is in your life. Romans 8. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you're not what he is. That is the spirit that is there. And we have this secure, eternal life. Okay? And I think that's one of the, the things that we have to deal with, that we got to come to terms with, is my salvation doesn't depend just on me. It's not up to me to do the right things and, and be the right person or be saved. He says to me in this passage that he has us in his hand and no one can snatch me out. No one can rip me out of the hand of God. It's by His power that I'm saved and that we're secure in that. That we don't have to spend every day wondering whether we're saved or not. Whether we're going to go to heaven or not. You know, I had someone ask me that one time in camp. Well, if you die right now, would you go to heaven? My answer is yes. Well, how can you be sure? Jesus. That's why He came. So I can know for sure whether I am saved or lost. Folks, how many Christians that we know of that are spending each day wondering whether they're saved or not? And if we struggle with that constantly, we're never going to grow. We're never going to go anywhere where Jesus wants us to be. That I am saved by the power of Christ, by my faith in Him, and I cannot be lost unless I turn my back on Him. I'm saved. That He has us in His hand. We're secure. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be worried. We have this assurance. Anybody know who this gentleman is? If you do, I will be greatly surprised. He's a French prime minister of years ago, George Clemenceau, and he fought a lot of duels. Okay? Um, and one day he was going to fight this duel with this man, and when he went to the train station to go to where they were going to shoot it out, he just wanted a one-way ticket. And his friend said, well, that's kind of pessimistic, isn't it? A one-way ticket? He said, no, I'm going to use my other guy's return ticket to come back. The confidence that he had, that he knew that he was going to be victorious. <coughs> we can do the same in life, folks. That we can have the confidence that we are victorious in this life. Uh, Romans chapter 8, we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. We are more than conquerors, not something in the future, right now in the midst of our life, that the Father is the ultimate power, and He holds me in His hand. He won't let anybody rip me away from Him. And what great, great confidence that should be. There's a preacher that went to see this lady. She's gone through a really rough time, and she told the preacher she thought that God had forsaken her. And the preacher sat there for a moment and said to the lady, throw your baby down on the floor. Why would I do that? No, go ahead, just throw the baby down on the floor. She said, I wouldn't throw my baby down on the floor for all the money in the world. And he says, what makes you think that you love your child more than God loves you? Why would you think that he's going to throw you away? It is the security that we can have here. More proof? They asked Jesus, how much more do they need? The miracles that he performed, the words that he has spoken, just how much more do they need? And in spite of all this, they say to Jesus, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Why don't people accept Jesus for who he is? I got a better question. Why don't I accept him for who he is? What am I doing in my life that keeps me from hearing Jesus? What is there in my life that keeps me from hearing Him? <clears throat> to answering His call, what is it? 
that I will not look to him and understand who he is. Because I can understand the gospel, but if I don't believe it, I'm not going to go anywhere. This is a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge built many, many years ago. And they were having a lot of problems getting it done until one of the engineers came up with this unbelievable thought. Do you know what it was? Safety net. That they had strung this safety net underneath the Golden Gate Bridge for the workers and they were amazed how much quicker they worked, how much more they got done. Why? They knew they were safe, that there was a net underneath them that would catch them if they fell. The same thing is true of us. There is this net. God himself with his arms outreached to catch me if I fall. Why then can I not accept him for who he is? Why then do I struggle with these things and, and I'm kind of mixed up? I think mental ascent means faith. We have a hearing problem or do we have a heart problem? Which is, what more proof do we need? We're on this side of the cross. We are witnesses of the greatest miracle that has ever occurred and that is the resurrection of Christ himself. So what more proof do you need to be convinced that Jesus is the Christ? How much more do we need in order to live a life of faith, a life of surrendering. There's a lot of possibilities that we can accomplish for God as individuals, as the church, that I see God working here in a lot of different ways, but until we have the faith to step out and accept Him, this is who He is, this is what I want to base my life upon, we're not going to do what God wants us to do. We're going to skip ahead here a couple of uh, things here. Anybody know who this gentleman is? His name is Felix Mendelssohn. He was a great, great pianist. And there was one day in this particular church that this organist was practicing on the organ and everything, and this man walked up behind him, and he kind of looked like a bum. His, his hair wasn't combed and, and things like that. And he said, can I play the organ? No. I'm not going to let some guy that looks like this play the organ. But the man continued to ask and ask and ask. And finally, the organist finally relented and said, yeah, you can play it because how long can a bum play an organ? What damage could he do while I'm standing right here? So this gentleman sits down and he begins to play the organ like the organist has never heard it played before. And he just plays and plays and people are starting to gather as they hear the music. And he gets done. And he starts to get up to walk away and the organist says, who are you? What is your name? And as he walks past him, as he's on his way out of the church, he says, my name is Felix Mendelssohn. And caught in awe, the organist plops down on the bench. And he says, just think, I almost didn't let the master play. If we are not opening ourselves up to Jesus, we're not letting the master play. We're not allowing him to work in the way that he wants to work. We have seen the miracles. We have seen his words. If we are not convinced of who Jesus is, my question is this, what more proof do you need? until we finally decide this is who we believe in. Our hymn of invitation and dedication is Into My Heart, 391 I believe is the number. It's a short little chorus, but the words are, are very emphatic, Into My Heart, that we again confuse mental assent with faith. We think because we have agreed with certain statements that all at once we're saved. It is when those statements change our lives, when we're transformed by the words of Jesus. Let's stand together. We sing this chorus just through.